this is a continuation of what we were talking about last time and figuring out how to describe the distributions of scores that we have in our data. So for this particular video, we'll be talking about group frequency distributions and specifically on how to determine the number and the size of the intervals that you'd want to use when creating one. So remember, last time we talked about the first um, of the four different ways that we can identify patterns in our data, the first being the frequency table. And this time we'll be talking about the grouped frequency table. So you'll notice that the difference is that there is an interval for the grouped frequency table. And for the frequency table, we simply have a single score per row. So just to review, when we're constructing a frequency table, we determine the highest and the lowest scores. We start with the highest value and go down to the lowest value. We include all values, even if the frequency of that value is zero. We label all of our columns. We include all of the cases. Here we have 20 different scores, and so this adds up to 20. And we check our accuracy by summing our frequencies. You might also have this cumulative frequency as well. So the first thing you need to know about the grouped frequency table is that all guidelines for frequency table that we just reviewed still apply. But you might see this is kind of an unwieldy amount of data. This is actually 70 scores that are the percent of alumni who give to their alma maters for 70 top universities. And in this case, it would be possibly really unwieldy to have a a frequency table. So we'd like to construct a group frequency table. So the next step is to determine the highest score and the lowest score. You'll see the lowest score here is 9. It actually has a frequency of 3, and we'll keep that in mind for later. The highest score is 61. In the next step, we want to get the full range of data. We want to know how many scores is it that we're dealing with. So what we do is we subtract the lowest score from the highest score, and then add one so we can get the full range of data. So we take 61, we subtract 9, and we add 1. So we take 52 plus 1 is 53. So we know our full range of data is 53 scores. Next, we want to determine the number of intervals and the best interval size. Usually, we want somewhere between 5 and 10 intervals, but if we have an extremely large data set, we may have more than that. In this case, between 5 and 10 intervals ought to work for us. So our full range of data is 53. So we might want to start out and say, OK, well, let's try an interval size of 5. So what I mean by interval size is I could count up my intervals by 5s, 5, 10, 15, 20, etc. So if I wanted an interval size of 5, I could take that full range of data and divide it by 5. But what I end up with is actually 11 intervals. So an interval size of 5 is a little bit too small. We like 5s and 10s because you know, our number system is base 10. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't have an interval size that's not based on a 5 or a 10. So let's just try um, what would happen if we chose an interval size of 6. So in an interval size of 6, we would take 53 again and divide by 6, and we get um, 8.83 intervals. So that gives us about 9 intervals. Again, it's a little on the high side. Um, it would be OK, but we tend to like to use 5s and 10s. So let's see what happens if we used an interval size of 10. We take 53, divide by 10, and we get 5.3. 5.3 intervals is within that range. And since we like the interval size of 10, I think we should go with it. So we'll actually round up to six intervals because you don't want a portion of an interval. So six intervals sounds good. The next step is to determine what is the bottom number of the lowest interval. And it should be a multiple of our interval size. Our interval size is 10, so whatever that bottom number of the range for the lowest interval should be a multiple of 10. The lowest interval, in this case, should start at 0. Now, I mean, if you were thinking multiple of 10, well, then it should start at 10. 
But the problem is that our lowest score is 9, so we need an additional interval be below that. And if we had an interval size of 10, that means that every interval jumps by 10. So I'll show you what I mean when we get to the next page. So next we're going to list intervals from highest to lowest and report the number of scores that there are in each interval. So essentially at this point, we're still figuring out our interval ranges. Our interval size is determined. It's already 10. We know that there's six. And we're going to then find the frequencies that fall within those ranges. So I've pulled up a table here. I know that the bottom of my lowest interval needs to be zero. And that's because we can't start at 10. We'll miss some of our data. You'll notice that as I add data, we go up by tens. That's our interval size. So the bottom of each interval will increase by the interval size, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. So I like to put in the bottoms of all my intervals first, and then I go back in and I add the upper limit. Now you'll notice that I put in 9.99 here because even if I wrote 0 to 9, technically it goes all the way up to, but not including the bottom of the next interval. But we don't need all those extra digits, so we can just put 0 to 9. And then that would be 10 to 19. And actually, again, it's 19.99. And we can continue to put the bottoms of our intervals in. Now the rest of this should be fairly easy, except for the fact that we have an, a, a rather large data set. But we can count up all of those points, or all of those scores that we have in our raw scores. So remember we started with, oh, here's our, our top score. We actually don't have anything else um, in the interval range from 60 to 69. So we know that's going to be 1. The bottom score, we noticed right away that there were three scores of 9. And I'm not going to go through the tedium of, of finding all the scores that fall in each of these intervals. Um, notice again here in this interval range from 50 to 59, we actually don't have any scores. And we still list the interval and include that score of 0. So all of the rules that we've been using so far apply. So that's how you construct a grouped frequency table. and. Just to give you a little preview about what's going on in the next video, I will be showing you how to create frequency histograms and frequency polygons.